Welcome to This Week in Missouri Politics, and welcome to our new viewers in the great Northwest on Fox 26 KNPN. Very glad that you welcomed us into our homes. Look forward to joining you every Sunday talking politics. And we're here this week with one of your own, Senator Tony Luke DeMeyer from, as your old colleague would say, the great Northwest. The great Northwest part of the state. Scott, it's great to be on the show. Well, thank you all, and thank you for the hospitality of having us on in the St. Joseph Market. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, we've got a great family, the Bradleys, who, as yep. you know, uh, own the news press. Legendary Missouri family. Legendary really. Missouri family conservatives, you know, which you yeah. don't see many of those in the media. Uh, but they own the news press, newspaper in St. Joe, and then own three of the four broadcast affiliates. And so really happy that you guys are going to be on the Fox affiliate uh, in Northwest Missouri. It's an honor to be part of that tremendous Missouri legacy. Let's talk about a, uh, a, uh, a quite a legislative legacy you're building. You and Representative Lane Roberts work together pretty well. You moved a bill, uh, 301, uh, talking, addressing some of the issues with Kansas City police officer pay. Explain to folks what you did there. So, so 301 that I have with Lane Roberts um, relates to concurrent jurisdiction for the circuit attorney's office in the city of St. Louis. Um, as a lot of your viewers would be familiar, uh, Kim Gardner, who is the circuit attorney in the city of St. Louis, uh, was installed in her position by George Soros. Uh, she's somebody who's been one of these kind of far left activist prosecutors, um, has been refusing to prosecute violent felony cases in mm -hmm. the city of St. Louis for, for years now. Um, and it's really reached a point where the state has to step in and do something. And so, uh, Representative Roberts filed a bill in the House that would empower the governor to appoint a special prosecutor to prosecute violent criminal offenses in the city of St. Louis in the event the circuit attorney's office refuses to do so. And so we have that bill now over in the Senate. Uh, Senator Rowden, the pro tem of the Senate, just referred it to the Judiciary Committee, which I chair. Sort of say. And we will be hearing that bill on Monday, and, and I've already... Through Something social tells me it's got a good shot, right? I think it's definitely got a good shot uh, <laughs> through the committee. Uh, yeah. You know, the floor of the Missouri Senate is always kind of a treacherous path for a bill, but we'll try to work it out. Let's break this down. Uh, this week, look, I think a lot of folks have criticized Kim Gardner yeah. and, and some of the issues in fighting with the cops and some of the issues in maybe um, the office not being staffed well and some folks walking free on some crimes. Just, uh, just management issues more than anything else. It, it felt like things took a different turn last this past week when when someone was in a car wreck a young athlete from out of town lost her legs because she was hit by a person that um probably should have had his bail or bond or probation revoked uh it, it just feels like things went different i know to the mayor tashara jones a, a person who's always been a very kind to kim gardner she didn't come out and call for her to resign but she did she did raise some questions um her response was pretty aggressive that she thought this was finger pointing it feels like there's a different tone in the air about the circuit attorney's office than there was a week ago. Yeah, I totally agree with that, absolutely. I mean, there has been a, an acknowledgement from Republicans for a while now that there are problems in the circuit attorney's office. There's always been broad-based denial, though, I think, among Democrats, particularly from the St. Louis area, that there's something wrong there. And this week, when Mayor Jones came out and made her statement, um, followed by a lot of other, frankly, liberal, more progressive politicians mm -hmm. in the St. Louis area, um, it became clear that this is a bigger problem for, for Kim Gardner. This is not just Republicans picking yes. on a Democrat prosecutor. These are people within her own party asking her to step aside. And so, I, you know, I think at this critical juncture right now, having the bill like House Bill 301 in the Judiciary Committee teed up, ready to go, um, it's, it's really the ideal time for us to be having this conversation. Feels like a creative way. A lot of, a lot of prosecutors who are most all big supporters of yours. Uh, have been worried about concurrent jurisdiction because there could someday be an attorney general as a Democrat and come into some of these rural counties and, and take over and, and grab cases. Yeah. It feels like this law was written to as best you could assuage the concerns of those local prosecutors. Yeah, that's exactly right. The way that the bill functions is you have to have a certain crime rate based on the number of homicides per capita in the area that you're in. And, and, and right now, the only the only jurisdiction that would fit that description would be the city of St. Louis. Uh, and it would be uh, unforeseeable uh, in the future for a rural county, for example, to ever get to the homicide rates that are called for under the bill that would trigger the, the special prosecutor provision. I figure you're going to hear this on the floor. I'll ask you here. What about local control? Kim Gardner did get elected overwhelmingly, did get reelected overwhelmingly. You, I think you'll see Senator May probably bring up that she's not trying to come to Platte County and tell you how to manage crime. Well, what I would say is, is that we have crime 
under control in Platte County. So it's a different mm -hmm. situation. And, and the reality is, is that St. Louis, and this is true for Kansas City as well, they're the major economic drivers for the state of Missouri. I mean, you look at most of the jobs, um, most of the economic activity in the state, it's coming out of the two major metropolitan sure. areas. And so when St. Louis or Kansas City fail, that affects the entire state. And so, and we do, we treat the city of St. Louis different in a lot of respects in state law right now. I mean, we refer to it as a city, not within a county. Yeah. We have hundreds of statutes that apply specifically to the city of St. Louis and don't apply to any other jurisdiction in the state of Missouri. And so I think this is an appropriate exercise of legislative authority for us to make sure that we're solving a huge crime problem in one of the largest cities in the state. Let's talk about something a little more fun. Mm -hmm. Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. Wonderful day. I've seen you. We're out enjoying the festivities. Um, but you couldn't put a bet on it. Could it's not. always interesting to me that Republicans run on freedom, liberty, God and country, right? But the little bit of money they don't tax you on, they tell you how to spend. I think it's just a bizarre thing that the government tells you that you're not smart enough to go bet 20 bucks on the Chiefs, which you would have had a great return on last week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I'm not of that mindset. Yeah. I'm a free market conservative. I think people should, you know, as long as they're not infringing on somebody else's rights and liberties, should be able to spend their money however they see fit. Um, so I sponsored the sports wagering bill this year. Um, we actually just passed it out of committee today. And um, what that legislation would do uh, very simply is it would allow Missouri to join a lot of our border states. We know Kansas passed it mm -hmm. last year, Illinois passed it in 2020. And so what we've been seeing is we've been seeing tax revenue that would ordinarily be earmarked for education and for schools leaving the state of Missouri and going to our border states. Um, so, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll find a path to get sports wagering done this year. I mean, people want to be able to bet on the Kansas City Chiefs, obviously on my side of the state, people want to be able to bet on the Mizzou Tigers during March Madness. And I think we are going to be in the tournament this year. Yeah. Um, you know, then uh, I, I think people should be able to make that decision for themselves. And in the meantime, we should not be losing, you know, educational dollars to, to our surrounding states. So before it's been caught up with issues of VLTs, uh, gray machines, whatever. Um, and the casinos have been pessimistic. I thought it was interesting when you filed this bill. Um, is this a bill that can meet the concerns of at least the casinos? Yeah, so the the casino, the 13 casino licensees in the state, they testified in support of the legislation, okay. uh, as did all six of the professional sports teams. Our St. Louis Cardinals testified yep. in support of it. The Chiefs testified in support of it. Um, so this has got broad-based support. Um, I'm not under any illusions. There's still some work to do whenever we get the bill. Let me just ask you the real question. Yep. Comes down to the floor. I'm sure there's going to be an amendment about VLTs. Yep. Can it get through the state Senate? without a VLT amendment, which probably would mean another year that Missourians are told by their government they can't bet on the Chiefs. Um, so that's not going to be my decision in all likelihood. There are going to be uh, a couple of members sure. who feel passionately about that issue, and that's really their decision. You know, I have put together what I think is a legislative package that um, you know, make sure we're protecting consumers mm -hmm. and make sure we're keeping tax dollars here in Missouri for our schools and make sure that the professional sports teams that we all know and love in our state are being protected and taken care of in the legislation. Um, if other senators want to hold the bill up on the floor, um, that's their business. I can't control that. All I can do is work collaboratively with everybody in the Senate to see if we can find a path to get a, to get a sports betting bill to the governor's desk. You filed a bill addressing transgender students playing in girls' sports. Um, the Republican Party has in the past uh, probably um, scored some very successful political points, maybe some stuff they weren't proud of in dealing with the LGBT community. Uh, the trans bill seems to be, trans athletes bill, seems to be a bill that, that I think regular folks have a hard time see, understanding why this would be fair. Break down why, I've never known you to be a person that's not empathetic. I think a lot of things are empathetic for a young person yeah. who's transitioning like that. Break down why this is the right thing to do, balancing the fairness with empathy for a young person who's in a challenging time. Yeah, so I mean, I look at this from the perspective of protecting young women who want to go into sports, whether it's to learn all the life lessons that you learn mm -hmm. from, from being involved in sports, losing gracefully, winning gracefully, college scholarships. You know, Title IX was set up as a, as a structure to allow women the ability to compete on an equal playing field when men dominated sports in the United States. Sure. And, and so Title IX, when it passed, it's interesting, there was a Democratic United States Senator that sponsored the legislation. It was signed into law by a Republican mm -hmm. president. So it was a bipartisan piece of legislation. When Title IX was originally signed, there were 300,000 female athletes in the United States, that's at the collegiate and high school level, 
within, I think it was 30 years after the signing of Title IX, that number went from 300,000 mm -hmm. to 3 million. And so what I don't want to see happen, and the reason that I filed this legislation, is to make sure that young girls have the ability to compete in sports, have the ability to have those opportunities. Because let's face it, there are genuine biological differences between mm -hmm. men and women. And the fact is, if, if you allow biological boys to compete in girls' sports, there's going to be less opportunities for scholarships, less opportunities for them to be able to get those life experiences. Well, uh, before you go, I want to ask you about opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, your name is probably one of the most mentioned that um, <clears throat> you can fundraise. Mm -hmm. You won what is a competitive district twice, pretty overwhelmingly. Um, I think there's not a statewide office that's open right now you're not mentioned for. I know several folks at the Bar Association mentioned you as somebody who'd be a very good fit on the Supreme Court. What are you thinking about right now? You know, uh, in all honesty, I mean, my focus right now is just getting through this legislative session. Um, you know, we've got a lot of important priorities. We've talked about some of those, you know, now, whether it's making sure we're protecting girls' sports. Uh, you know, I've got some legislation to provide tax relief to seniors. I've got a bill to... Uh, make sure that our Kansas City Police Department officers are, are being paid adequately relative to their peer departments. And so, you know, my focus until, you know, we get through this legislative session is going to be on doing my best as a state senator. I'm blessed to have gotten the confidence and the vote of the people in Platte and Buchanan County to continue for another four years in the Senate. And so I'm going to remain focused on that uh, until we get through the session. So folks should look for an announcement during session, but the door's open to continuing public service in 24 or after, right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've enjoyed my time in the Senate. Um, you know, I love public service. It's, it's a bit of a family enterprise. I have a, a relative uh, who's a member of Congress from the middle part of the state. And, um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed my time in public service and would like to be able to continue down that path. Well, Senator, as you, as session winds on, and as you come closer to making a decision, I hope you'll come back and talk about it with us here on This Week in Missouri Politics. You bet. We'll be right back with our opinion maker panel, Warrensburg's own Dan Houston. But first, go to the shoremissouri.com. This is Missouri one county at a time. Holt County, right in the great northwest in our new viewing area. We'll be right back after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. All throughout Missouri, businesses are struggling to find workers. Child care challenges are a big reason why. Our kids are losing out, too. Through high-impact early childhood investments, we can support the workforce of today and better prepare our workforce of tomorrow. Empower families with the resources they need to succeed. Reduce crime and avoid costly interventions, saving taxpayers money. Together, we can make Missouri the best place to work, raise a family, and be a kid. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. And welcome back to this week in Missouri Politics. But again, I want to thank everybody watching us for the first time on our Fox affiliate at St. Joseph in the great Northwest. Joined back in by Representative Dan Houks of Warrensburg. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you for being in the 54th District. I love it. Ashley Oni, Kansas City, thank you so much for being the time. Thanks for letting me And a, Je a Jackson County old school politician. Very glad to have Jeff Gurley on. Thank you for making the time, sir. You bet. Glad to be here. Dan Houks, tell me, you're going to, I guess, if you're a state employee, Open up your paycheck and get a little extra cheese in there, right? We, we, we sure did. We passed the uh, supplemental budget. We have one all every year. Gives about an 8.75% raise to our uh, state employees. We want to take care of them, but did not raise money for the legislature. Well, but I tell you, you in, in a world where you get, you're trying to keep employees, not just the state, but everybody. Everybody. I mean, if you don't raise pay, you, you're going to have you know, lesser skilled folks. You're going to lose your tenured people, retrain them. I mean, people say run, run government like a business. Well, this is what every business is running like. Correct. Definitely yeah. need to retain them. Representative, I assume this is one you didn't have too hard a time voting yes on, right? Absolutely not. They aren't one of your rare yeses, thrilled. right? <laughs> <laughs> I, w I was thrilled to support it. I mean, we've been hearing from our state workers for so long that they, they 
want a cost of living raise. They they want to be competitive in the market, and we can't compete with other states around us if we're not paying them competitively. So I'm thrilled thrilled about it. Every part of the state, every part of the country, I think, um, everybody has a different maybe reason why. But through COVID, it's hard to find employees. The state's having the same issue. I don't know if they've ever had this many open uh, FTE slots, and, and maybe they're getting by without it, but you, you, people talk about do more with less. No, and in reality, over time, you do less with less. Well, we had some of the worst paid employees at the state level in the entire country, and so bringing that up, even to that 8% uh, bump, um, just gives an opportunity to retain the employees, the good yeah. employees that we have, and then hopefully attract uh, the, some more that are out there and fill those, uh, those vacancies. So. It is interesting. The more you see kind of the jobs changing, you do see some higher salaries. But one of the state, and usually government in general can offer is a little bit better benefits package. I think that's probably stayed the same, but I mean, there's, there comes a point where that take home pay matters, and mm -hmm. you're going to make your decision to leave those benefits behind if it's just substantial. And I think it was getting substantial, it's just hard to keep folks. Yeah. Um, Dan Alex, uh, something I think is uh, put some folks in some interesting positions. Uh, some of the allegations that, that have came out about WashU. Um, for those that don't know, one of the world class educational institutions right in St. Louis, Missouri, private school. Um, truly a leader in all kinds of innovation. However, uh, they have some things that have come under scrutiny recently. There's always been some controversy surrounding their training of uh, doctors that can perform abortions. That's in Missouri been a controversial thing that's been talked about in the state yes. Senate a great deal. Now there's a, a, a transgender center and there's some allegations come out from some employees there that maybe the protocols, whatever they are, weren't being followed that closely. It's made, I think, everybody take a look at WashU globally. It has, and you know, good thing that Washu has a big endowment. They might yes. need to use that. <laughs> it did, though. I've seen some Republicans. Uh, they were very generous. Some of their alumni uh, forms, formed a group to put together some money to to help influence state elections. I'm not sure. I, I guess the success of that could be debated, but I've seen some folks put in some interesting spots. I've never believed campaign contributions make the difference. But it's something that it's, it's in the algorithm of a, of a decision maker, right. no matter if you're just being real. Um, I wonder if this was Mizzou, what would be happening? Oh, I'm sure they'd <laughs> probably be burning it down. Yeah, I think that, that might be right. <laughs> Representative, I uh, was at a press conference last week and Senator Denny Hoskins. Uh, I just asked him, I said, would you send your child to a charter school sponsored by WashU, which there are in St. Louis, uh, the same town as their transgender center? And he looked at me, somebody that has generally been supportive of sending more money to those types of schools and said no. I asked him if, if Rob Bennett, if Dan Alcott, if David Pierce would send their kids. He said no. I think he's right. That may, that may be true. You know, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the bad press around it is, is one of those things that I think is going to um, tarnish the, uh, the positive legacy that it has had thus far. Mm -hmm. um, I do have some concerns about the allegations and how the um, interview of the whistleblower was put behind a paywall. That seems a little bit sketchy to me in terms of how these allegations rolled out um, and maybe um, I, I just have some questions about who, who gains in this. Um, well, the interview was on CNN. You have to subscribe to Cable Satellite to watch that. So, I mean, uh, let me sure. ask you this. This is an interesting question. And I, this is one thing I like talking to you about it because I always feel like you have a pretty good feel for regular people. Uh, if there were protocols that weren't followed, that would be something that I think anybody that was pro the LGBT community, community would want looked into. Absolutely. The allegations are serious. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to diminish that at all. If, if they're true, they must be addressed. That said, I'm skeptical, is all. Interesting. Tell me about it. You can look over from, you look over the other side of 70, and you see this world-class institution, by all accounts, a, a credit not just to the state, but to the country. But um, it's not, it, it, they kind of, they're not just a college, right? It's not just like you, like if you go to a lot of universities now, they just teach you their, your degree and they give you a degree and you move on with your life. You know, they have hospitals. Mizzou, or Washi has a world-class affiliation with BJC. Um, and then they've got a lot of other things going on, right? I think the charter schools are getting a fresh level of scrutiny uh, in the last few months. I think you're seeing now the, this transgender center is something that uh, I didn't, I bet you most folks didn't even know existed. Right. And now I think everybody's gonna learn a lot about it in the next few weeks. I'm interested in finding out all of the facts. 
I'm also very concerned about legislating against any kind of LGBT type issue because of the economic development impact that it will have on this spit on, on the state of Missouri. Folks. Okay, so there are national corporations and groups that will not come to states that they view as discriminating against the LGBT community. And if, some, if there's some government overreach as a result of this, uh, where we're using, government would be using it as an excuse to discriminate against the LGBT community and transgender people, we could be missing out on tens of millions of dollars in economic development and impact. And we need to think about that from a government standpoint. Dan House, I'd like to talk to you because you're a businessman. Yes, I, think what, I think what the man says is true. Is. There is a point where some corporations are not going to be interested in Missouri if they believe they're somehow hostile to certain groups that, that frankly, you know, I grew up in the Boot Hill. If, if you were in one of those groups at, when you grew up around me in the 90s, it would have been hard. You would, you right. would have faced a tough road to hoe, frankly. Right. And I'm not proud of that, but that's where I grew up, and that's just a fact. So I have, I have a heart for folks. However, there is a line of folks elect you with a certain set of values. They kind of want them held up. There's folks in Knob Noster that have a view of the world that, that should be respected, too. It's got to be tough sometimes finding that balance because you don't want to hurt the state. No, we don't want to hurt the state. And in government, we need to watch what we do. And I think yeah. we've been under the close eye of watching the different things we've done the past couple of years. Maybe not going as far as one would think mm -hmm. and, and backing it off a little bit. It looks to me, it, it feels to me like there's a willing, there was a willingness the last couple of years in the chamber to pass a bill that, that made it where a transgender student couldn't play in the girls' team. Correct. It feels like that some members of the General Assembly said, okay, let's do the show me state approach. Let's give this a couple years, and if this is still an issue, come back to it. And, and just my, just Steinem knowledge, hillbilly opinion feels like now you've gave it a couple years and the issue didn't die down. Correct. I have to think, when you, before you leave in May, some form of that bill goes to the governor's desk. I would think so, and you know, it, it really stemmed up this past summer with the uh, woman uh, swimmer mm -hmm. who brought big light to uh, transition people in competing against women. This is one where I, I, I think there's some of your colleagues in the, in the Republican Party historically has used gay people, tra not really transgender, it's a new thing, but they're just gay people for political purposes and, and been successful at it. However, I do think there's a person that could use logic and say, you know what, I'm not a bigot, but I don't think this is fair. And I've heard that from a lot of my colleagues. Um, you know, I, I don't discriminate, um, but I don't think this is fair, or I'm just trying to protect our girls. Uh, and, you know, what I hear from young athletes and their parents um, over and over again, every year in these committee hearings and outside of the committee hearings in my own community, is that they just want to be left alone. You know, we're not... There are no true examples in Missouri that we can point to of anyone losing a scholarship uh, over this. There, you know, we're, we're talking about kids. We're not talking about Olympic athletes uh, necessarily. We're talking about K through 12 kids. Um, and in my opinion, we should just let kids be kids. Let them learn how to play on a team. Let them understand what the value of that is, and and really um, live that in their childhood. Um, and then if they if they become uh, athletic enough to a point where they're going to compete at another level, uh, maybe that's where the scrutiny begins. Where is that line? I mean, because the, I think Look, we're talking about. Do, do, do any anybody up here know how many kids we're talking about in Missouri? Hmm? Five. Five. The General Assembly in Missouri is spending all of this time talking about five kids. That is a waste of time. It's government overreach, and we could be doing much better work in the General Assembly to make this state better. Now, Dan, I also think that if you did not spend that time on those five kids, I'm not sure Ashley or Jeff would like what you did instead right. much more, right? Uh, but I, it, is, it is very interesting to keep that, keep that thing in the middle, something that I know you've worked on pushing, and it feels like it's another issue that's ripening a sports book. Right now, right. it's just bizarre to me. People run as conservatives. Keep the government out of my life. I don't want the government in my life. And the little bit of money they don't take from taxes, they want to tell you you can't spend 20 bucks betting on the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl. Right. It's just bizarre to me. What is an argument you hear from a Republican who told his constituents, I'm for freedom and liberty and all the stuff they say when they're on Facebook being weird. What is the argument for, I want the government to then, I want to tell people how they can spend the money that we don't take in taxes. Well, 
That's a great question. You know, just during the Bengals Chiefs game a couple weeks back before they went to the Super Bowl, there were four four thousand seven hundred and fifty one attempted bets just at Arrowhead alone during that four hour okay. period. At the same time in Kansas there's one point one four million bets placed. You know, it's definitely clear that we see it, uh, you know, I know the, the representative even said it in a committee during special session that while she was out door knocking on the campaign trail, it was the number one issue she heard about in the state. Not not anything else. That was it. Why can't I bet? Why can't I bet? Why can't I bet? But we did have good news today. We got it out of emerging issues. It will now go to a rules committee and uh, hopefully have it on the floor before spring break. You know some old boys on the rules committees, don't you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Representative, I, I watched some of these doors. I wouldn't, I wouldn't watch you knock these doors. And it is, I, I think people truly don't understand why it's the government's business if you want to bet on the Chiefs. Right. Right. I can't tell you how many doors I knocked where someone answered the door and I said, what, are, what issues are important to you? And they sat there and they said, why haven't we passed sports betting? <laughs> and I, I didn't say, let me introduce you to a gentleman named Denny Hoskins. <laughs> <laughs> But what I did say is I share your frustration, and I want it too, and I will continue working to move it forward in Missouri. But I think, though, I mean, Jeff, you've been around long enough. Yes, Denny Hoskins has a bill he'd like to leverage uh, on VLTs and make it a uniform regulatory system. Um, however, I think you learned in the session last year it was not just Denny Hoskins. There's a whole bunch of casino folks that are not down with this, and they're not happy, and they're willing to, they're willing to fight and find their allies to fill the bush with this bill. Now, they're trying to find the right language and to make it profitable to them. I, you know, during um, lockdown with COVID, things changed for the casinos um, quite a bit. And so they're trying to find their way to attract more people. And I think that there are multiple avenues to, to figure that out. You know, I'm very fortunate personally as someone that watches a lot of sports and bets that I live very close to Kansas. So I can drive about about two minutes to get over to the Kansas <laughs> side and legally bet um, after betting uh, offshore, uh, you know, for, for years. I want to keep my money in Missouri. I really, really do. And I think that we're going to get close to finding that solution very soon. With a minute left, I'm betting they're going to throw us off if we don't get to who won the week. Uh, Missouri travelers that get to go to the new KCI terminal, which looks just fantastic. It's going to be far more, uh, you know, accessible for for bathrooms and restaurants, and it it, it takes a big step forward to keeping Kansas City as a, a world class city. Represent who won the week? I think it's floor leader John Patterson. Uh, he uh, cleared the way or this week uh, to have a, a pretty uh, safe speaker run, and and I think yep. that uh, things are looking good for him right now. Good for Jackson County, right? Absolutely. Yep. Who won the week? The guy, guys are award winner Pat Thomas. Oh man, uh, wonderful lady. Terrific person. I mean, right now I know we're on the campus of the University of Central Missouri, but I think Mizzou's in a great spot, and his they decisions are. like awarding someone that actually accomplishes like Pat Thomas. Uh, they're probably doing as well as I've seen them do in my professional lifetime. I'm going to give the winner of the week to someone else. Um, Mayor Tashara Jones. Her, her friends and enemies alike say she's a pretty loyal person. And her comments this week about some of the turmoil in the circuit attorney's office, uh, it's in this day and age very easy to agree with your party all the time. Very tough to uh, speak out. I know that wasn't easy for her, but probably, uh, probably something everybody in the city of St. Louis and maybe Jeff City needed to hear. We'll see you back next week for This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and Sterling Bank.